Hi everybody, welcome. I haven't done one of these for a while, so I'm very excited. And something a little bit different today because you'll be able to see I have two people with me today instead of just one. So this is going to be interesting to see how this works out. So introductions. Some of you will know Mike Ingram because we have spoken before with Mike on a number of occasions. But I also have with us today Thomas Dennis. And this young man here has been working with Mike on a fantastic and innovative history project which you already need to know about in case you haven't come across it already it's called swiping through history and um, as always anything we talk about when we're doing this including links to all your social media and videos and stuff will go in the show notes underneath the video all right so people will be able to access that straight away so first of all for those of people who don't know either one or both of you introductions so Thomas, we'll start with you. Uh, well, hi. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me uh, here, Catherine. Uh, my name is Thomas Dennis. Uh, I basically launched Swiping Through History uh, last year during the first lockdown with, with Mike. And our objective was really to try and find a new way of telling old stories, uh, stories from history. Uh, my background is I'm an actor. Um, I've performed in a number of uh, West End shows and leading roles for the National Theatre um, in London and, and around the country as well. And uh, my love for history is, well, it, I've been in love with history since I was a child. And actually it was history that got me into acting because it's the ability to tell stories and walk in the footsteps of people who have gone before. And uh, with the whole lockdown situation and also just with watching a lot of documentaries, which I'm a big, big fan of, I just thought to myself, well, actually, I think there, there could be a new way of telling these stories, a new way of approaching these documentaries where we try and make it a little bit more relatable to, to the modern day and also to a younger, more contemporary audience. So the, the dream is and the, the project we're working on, uh, Swiping Through History, is all about trying to tell these old stories in a short, fast and exhilarating way. And then with Mike's expertise on board, we can then go into more detail and explore all the all the intricacies of the historical research as well alongside it but primarily we focus on telling the story and all the kind of juicy bits that basically get everybody excited in the first place so that's kind of my background that's uh, what uh, the aim is the objective is uh, with swiping through history and uh, yeah mike i'll hand over to you thank you um yes yeah, so if you don't know me i'm mike ingram uh, I'm primarily a medieval historian, uh, but I do do other bits as well. Um, I started off doing just battles, but realised that you can't understand the story without looking at all the other stuff around it. So I, in more recent years, I've become much more of a general medievalist, uh, looking at medieval history. Um, I also write books. Um, my new book on Bosworth is probably... Um, the most famous one, uh, but also I've written books on my own county, Northamptonshire, uh, again, telling that the whole story. Um, yeah, that, that's me and that's where I come from. Yeah, and um, the, we, I've done a review in a, on your book, so I'll pop that underneath as well. So, yeah, um, yeah it's an excellent book if anybody's interested in that period, because it really breaks everything down. It's not just about the battle, it's about... Um, the locations, the connection with France, which is often not touched on really. And that's, that's the big thing I think that's different in your book is that, that sort of side of the story and role that the, that the French played in Bosworth that people don't see and, and don't necessarily know about. And if you like armory and all that type of thing, that's all in there as well. So it's a really all encompassing work. So yeah, you need that one. You, need that one. you don't have it, you need that one. Um, right. Okay. So obviously this is kind of like your first big project, isn't it? What you're doing at the moment. And you're talking about the various battles that encompass what we know now as the Wars of the Roses, because obviously that's not what it was called at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so why? Because I'm sure later on, obviously this, this will only go on for so long. It will get to a point where the battles have finished. People kind of disagree on exactly when the Wars of the Roses finishes. Anywhere from people saying Bosworth to Stoke up until Margaret Pole was executed. You know, that there's this kind of a blurry line. So I'm sure you have other things that you might look at later on, but why specifically did you think, yes, this is where I want to start and this is what I want to do? 
I, I think for, for me, um, one of the main reasons is I, I love this period of history, but I think more importantly, linking to the idea behind it, which is that it's, we, we don't want history to be boring. Mm -hmm. I, I don't believe history is boring in the slightest. I think it's a big misconception that people have when they say they kind of, uh, they kind of pass it off because oh, I don't like history just boring. And, it, and it's something that for me, I know that I loved history at school, but actually history I found incredibly boring at school. I, 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 I'm in love with history, but at school it was boring. And, and for me, it was because, you know, essays and, and, and books and all of this is, is not the only way of kind of reaching out and, and, and connecting with people. Um, I think, you know, if you have numbers on a page, sometimes it can dilute the, the human element and the actual mm -hmm. fact that this, these are real people and that's happened to real people. And I think one of the big examples for me was uh, Game of Thrones. And this is where my acting career connects quite significantly is I watch Game of Thrones and I love Game of Thrones because I look at it and I think to myself actually what they're doing is they're telling the story of the Wars of the Roses in many ways of course they're fictionalizing it as well but it is based on on English history and British history and has a lot of different other elements involved as well um, and, and so when you look at that and you go well this was one of the most successful TV series ever made you know that it's not the story that's boring. <laughs> it's the way we tell the story, right? Is if it has a worldwide audience fascinated by, by the, the TV show, then actually you go, well, actually that story is, is based on truth. Mm -hmm. And when you realize that the story is based on truth, it kind of, well, it blows my mind a little bit. Um, and I just think it's incredible when you think about it. And then you look at the Wars of the Roses and you have all these incredible characters and these relationships and these you know, these traumatic experiences that these people went through. And I just think that it was a fantastic place to start because of it. Mm. Uh, our, our motto is, you know, it's not the story that bores us, it's the way we tell it. And I think with the Wars of the Roses, it's a perfect way in of looking at these relationships, these characters, and looking at them as people mm. uh, and seeing how actually, you know, emotions like, like revenge is a big one that Mike and I talk about, you know, and how that drives people to do this. And obviously it's on the, it's on the world stage. It's, it, you know, it's, it's, it's affecting the, the country of England and the people of England at the time. Um, and so that's kind of where Wars of the Roses started. And then it also developed because there isn't a series out there that has looked at every single battle. They look at the main ones and they cover yeah. the overall kind of arc of it. But, you know, the smaller battles like Ludford Bridge or, or Hedgley Moor or Hexham, you know, you don't have documentaries, you know, it doesn't matter how long they are, but you just don't have them exploring each of these, uh, these battles and following the story of the Wars of the Roses through it. And I think when you look at like a, a contemporary uh, kind of connection, you've got, the, um, you've got the likes of sport now with like football where you, you know, you have a score. So it's like one nil, one all, two one. And, and it just, the, the way these battles kind of go through, I always find it interesting with the Wars of the Roses that, you know, or the Yorkists won this many and the Lancastrians won this many. So as you go along the score, the tallies, they kind of, you know, it's one nil and then it's one one and then it's two one and then it's two two. And, and so I just think that's also an interesting way of exploring the period and seeing how, kind of the power shifts and how things kind of change as it moves forward. So that's really why, in the longest answer I think I've ever given, <laughs> why we actually- We need information, we need information. Yeah, um, which is why we started with the Wars of the Roses. So um, that kind of leads me nicely when you're talking about the football analogy there into what I was going to ask you next is to kind of explain what you do. So obviously we've established what the information is you want to get across and why you want to get it across that way. So if people haven't seen any of your videos, because you do do like Zoom talks as well, don't you? To, uh, yeah, you kind of have the video about the battle and then you guys will get together and discuss it as well to get into the nitty gritty if any other questions and stuff have come up. But when you do the videos that, that you out there, literally in the field sometimes, uh, explain to people how you work that with the analogies and the 10,000 steps. Yeah, so we use, um, I came up with this uh, during lockdown, obviously last year, I think everybody has kind of rekindled a, a love or a hatred for going for a walk, you know, uh, going for a daily walk, because that's what we could do. We had one hour of, of exercise a day and, and people went out to try and get their 10,000 steps because 10,000 steps has become this kind of 
mantra for health. You know, if you manage to do 10,000 steps in a day, you're leading a healthy lifestyle, apparently. Um, but it's just this kind of contemporary thing of I was out walking and I realized that actually on a walk, I went around near where I live in London. There's all these pockets of history. I walked across a, 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 a civil war battle. I, you know, I came across Siren House where Henry VIII was in his coffin. And, you know, you come across all these little kind of, you know, little pockets. Uh, and so I actually thought to myself, well, these battles in, in the Wars of the Roses, they took place in throughout England. And uh, actually, a lot of people come across them on their walks, I think, especially like St. Albans. Uh, if you're walking around St. Albans during the day, you're not just walking across one battlefield, you're walking across two, uh, you know, for two different, two different events. So um, the 10,000 steps is the idea of actually going out and walking in the footsteps of uh, other people and exploring how far the 10,000 steps can actually take you. Uh, it's not just a goal to achieve in a number of steps, but in that 10,000 steps, where are you walking? How far are you walking? And, and how much history is kind of the stories of the, the area you're walking in and just raising awareness for that. Um, and then on the other hand, it's very much about trying to make a contemporary uh, correlation, connecting to a younger contemporary audience, you know, um, who, you know, we're used to flicking through our phones and the social media element and things like that. So, for example, with the first Battle of St. Albans, uh, Mike has a fantastic interpretation where he uh, relates the battle to being almost the equivalent of a, a, a kind of a contemporary football fan standoff that kind of turns yeah. into like this yeah, kind it wasn't of... really a battle battle was it it was a bit of a fisticuffs <laughs> really a yeah. posh fisticuffs exactly and, and i think that's it and then suddenly when you when we look at it and we go you know we speak to younger people and say you know okay uh you know the chance who are you who are you 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 know you may have been in a football ground yourself you may you know you may support a team and you know you'll support them to your dying day you know and you have that fierce passion about it mm -hmm. uh now now, now think of that and think of it a few hundred years ago and it's it's similar these these people had that fierce passion for the families they served they had their fierce rivalries their fierce enemies and their disagreements and you've got these two groups of you know men facing off against each other shouting at each other insulting each other and it just ends up exploding and turning into this big street brawl that ends up being considered a battle and 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 in a way i think then people can relate to it um, and so that's just one example of how we try and find ways of making it relate. Um, and I think it's a very good one because <laughs> uh, I like, I, I like, I just think Mike's interpretation is, is fantastic and, and putting a voice to that is what we're all about. So. Yeah. And we, we absolutely do need to find new ways to approach things, to appeal to the younger generations. It makes me feel really old when I say that. <laughs> because I, I'm not the younger generation anymore, but my, you, you, Mike will attest to this. Your brain doesn't come out of that, does it? No, no. <laughs> in, in my head, I'm your age, Thomas. I'm not. <laughs> I'm, old, I'm old enough to be your mum. But you know, it's just like... But that's so, fantastic because that means that even though we're trying to relate to a younger audience, it doesn't mean we're not relating to an older audience as well. It's, it's not like we're saying this is specifically for 16 to 24 year olds. Mm -hmm. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is let's just find a new way of looking at it. A yeah. new way of telling the story. And then what you might, what we're, we're aiming to do is for people who might not, you know, might have basically put the history books away after school because they just couldn't deal with the essays and the, the interpretation and all of that, you know, that actually they, they come across a story that we tell and they go, you know what, that's quite cool. Well, that's quite interesting. You know, um, thinking that Joffrey Baratheon, for example, was inspired by a real character is like, you know, suddenly it's like, wow. Terrifying. It's terrifying, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, before I do the next bit, just let me know, how do you, did you guys meet? Mike, how did you guys meet? Um, way back when, we were just having a debate because we couldn't remember how long ago it was. Um, <laughs> I was doing a tour of um, the Siege of Bedford uh, and Tom came along as a young lad of about 14 years old um, and he hadn't stopped talking since and that, that's that's where it began I suppose uh, and then when the time came Thomas has obviously been following me with what I've been doing at Bosworth and the like um, and we, we tested it at Bosworth to see if it would work uh, and some of the ideas that we, we wanted to put forward because uh, the other key thing, of course, in, in 
what we're presenting is, is accuracy as far as possible. There are far too many tired old Victorian stories about the battles. The Victorians, uh, they love that, it. That are actually out there. Yeah. So the other thing that, that we try and do um, is not only do we never present one story, we will always give the options and say, well, this is a possibility and that's a possibility, but this is the one that we think it is because. Mm. Yes. Um, yeah. And so we keep it as wide as possible. Mm. Uh, and so, sorry, I've got off your subject a little bit, but <laughs> that's where it started talking from, talking with Thomas about this uh, and a few of the TV programmes that I've been in. Um, I wasn't happy with you do your talking head bit and then the story around it that suddenly appears in the finished article mm. is not the real history. Yeah. So this, this was mine and Thomas's conversations, um, which grew into a test piece at Bosworth, which worked really nicely. Um, and, and then we carried it on. And, and that's where it sort of came from. So what did you think when Thomas got in touch with you and said, I've got this idea? What do you reckon? Oh, it, it was. I thought it was the just the ideal thing to do it because exactly what Thomas has already said. Uh, it, I just thought, okay, yeah, we can, we can do this and we can make it work. So we did, and it works. Well, we think it works. It definitely does work. Although, as we were talking just before, it's all sort of like nearly everything else at the moment. Your progress is being hampered by COVID. Because, yes. as you said, you know, it's about being out there and showing people the locations, where they are, what they look like. That would have been there. That would have been there. Did you know when you walked down this high street, this is actually where you are? And so on. And, and at the moment, you're unable to access these locations, which is, <laughs> I think most of us feel your pain in that capacity. Um, but where we are now is that you've your, your first video was on that the aforementioned first battle of St Albans wasn't it and the most yeah. recent one that was put up there was about the second battle of St Albans yeah. um, now there is so much I guess you talked about there not being an ice cream van <laughs> yeah I, I would have been equally disappointed as yeah. you were about that it, very much so um so the wars of the roses this is one of those things where back to what you were saying Mike earlier about oh there was this battle and this battle and you were sort of like initially sort of a battlefields historian but there is just a crazy amount of context to these battles because it's not just about the house of Lancaster and the house of York and they fell out and it got a bit nasty and you know it's, it's that's like the briefest naffest summary ever <laughs> but um you know to start We've been struggling to be that 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 clear and that kind of simple for a long time and you've just nailed it on the head <laughs> that was kind of, this is what wars of the roses was these two people <laughs> stick with each other and it, lots of arguing and then they pretty much all killed each other and then they, this was the result at the end <laughs> you know and this all ends up with this guy called henry tudor and and um but I think what happened initially, so I'm going to ask you sort of like this impossible task now, for which I semi-apologise, sorry, not sorry. Um, the, the Wars of the Roses kind of started with, it wasn't about leadership and kingship as such initially, was it? Mm -hmm. um, so, and then obviously by the end, there was, there was lots of sort of inter-house relationships and fallings out and beheadings and all sorts of stuff where it did very much become about kingship and, and ruling the country. So, Mark, I'm going to start with you. So initially, what kicks off the battle, uh, the, the first battle or the skirmish or the undercurrent that led to the tension that became the Battle of St Albans? I think you have to go back a, a lot further. Uh, and we always have this conversation that people are hoping for a simple answer and they just don't exist. Um, but we can take it back to Richard of York uh, and it does appear on the surface that all he wants to do is to rid his kings of his evil counsellors mm. uh, and by the time you get to St Albans uh, bearing in mind that Richard's had at least two revolts beforehand that have failed mm. um, he comes to the fore uh, and it does initially appear to be yet another negotiation between them um, 
but they, then you've got the extra player of Somerset in there, mm. um, who then um, his one in Richard's eyes is one of the king's evil counsellors. Um, but then you've got the side story of the the Nevilles falling out with uh, the Percys, yeah. which which is a separate argument. And I do got to the point now where I. I truly believe that St Albans was actually started because the row between uh, Somerset, uh, sorry, between the Percy's and the Neville's gets out of hand, forcing Richard to fight. Yeah. That makes uh, sense. Yeah. Um, so so that, that's sort of where it comes from in a short answer. You will hear a lot more about it if you go and have a look at the, uh, the videos uh, and see how Thomas has wonderfully actually portrayed it on the ground on the battlefield. Um, but I think that's where it where it sort of comes from. But I would say to everybody, uh, the only way you really truly understand a battlefield, you can read every single book going, but until you actually get on the on that battlefield and follow in the footsteps, will you before you actually get a, a lot better and, and what I always think an in depth understanding, which again is why Thomas does it because he gives you a glimpse of what it would have been. Go out there with a book. Or several books. When when I first wrote my my first Bosworth book, um, that's all I did. I had a, an empty field. I had the archaeological maps of where everything was, and I had the original sources. And I spent weeks just walking around Bosworth, looking at both. Um, hopefully, I've taken the task of doing that for several weeks to do it when you read my works. Um, but yeah you still need to go and have a look at it and stand there and understand and, and feel it. I think it's, uh, I think it's very much the experience we had when we filmed um, the Battle of Wakefield, for example, which is uh, a particular battle that we know very little about, actually, um, in terms of substantial evidence. So it's a lot of interpretation. It's a lot of interpreting, you know, you know what could have happened and how could it have happened and all of this. Um, but until you go and stand like at Sandal Castle and look out across the battlefield, you, you don't, you, you know, it, it, until you do that, you can't really possibly imagine it. Whereas when you're there, especially this battle, because it is all about interpretation, it feels like you're solving a murder mystery. And, and that's just fantastic because you stood, you stood at the top of the keep and you're pointing out, OK, so she might have come from there. But what about this? What about that? What about the other? And as a result, you kind of come to your own conclusions, which is another way of history being, you know, I'm not saying my conclusion is necessarily what happened or, or Mike's is exactly what happened. What we're saying is, is this is what we believe Mm. could have happened but mm. then it's it's up to you it's up to you guys to go and enjoy doing that as well to find out for yourselves what you think would have happened you know with the with what you know about the characters involved and I think that's a really uh, exciting kind of um, adventure to embark upon with this as well and, and these battlefields you know a lot of them they're, they're in you know they are in a public domain you know they're, they're places you can access you can go and and you know it looks like this year you know traveling abroad and things like that might be difficult but hopefully when things you know uh, lockdowns and things kind of um, loosen off a little bit we'll be able to go and explore these sites and 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 it is it is walking in the footsteps of 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 those who've gone before and and it's it's like standing in Sandal Castle and putting yourself in Richard Duke of York's shoes and saying this is the decision he made why did he make it there is no better way of trying to understand it in my opinion than than doing that as as Mike has uh, has rightly said and that really goes back to what you were saying just now about <sighs> like it becoming a real experience and these are not just you, you can put yourself in that situation. If you read something in a book, books are fantastic. And we, I mean, we're all big book lovers in the history world. Um, but when something's not more recent, it's very easy to almost forget that these were people, you know, I, I see this a lot with the wives of Henry VIII is like, you know, Catherine Howard was a silly little tart who deserved it. And Anne Boleyn was like, you know, she was just a horrible conniving cow and she deserved to have her head cut off. And Anne of Cleves was just like the stupid, ugly one. And luckily now that the people are coming out and saying, no, none of these characters were perfect. Anne Boleyn, for example, was very fiery. She was the wrong person for Henry. And, and Henry was the wrong person for everybody, let's be honest. But, you know, it, it's just people say these sort of really harsh statements because people are that far back they can't see them as real people. And although 
I use the word ethics quite loosely, but the, the, the ethics and the understandings and what was acceptable and how people viewed things were very different. But people were still people. They still loved and hated and sought revenge, as you were saying. Yeah, that is an overriding drive. And being in a building or a location helps you to, as you both so rightly said, you can much easier think, wow. So I've been to Bosworth with Mike and you're standing there and you're just thinking they were here. They were all here. And what must that be like to be standing there thinking this is probably it. This very well could be it. And, and to me to think that, you know, I don't know any spoilers here, but Mike will take you to the place where he has examined all the different locations and, and the evidence where it's likely that Richard actually fell and to think that you're standing there and on that spot, all those people that were involved in that final little fracas there could have been there blows my mind. And, you know, it's like going to Hampton Court and being in the long gallery and thinking they all walked down here. Mm. Henry, the wives, Wolsey, Cramner, Cromwell, all of them. And you cannot get, you can read a million books, but it is not the same as standing in that spot in your own mind for 10 minutes. I think, uh, I think uh, another example I always like using, and I'm taking it slightly away from Wars of the Roses and the Tudors here, but another one is when you go to the battlefields in Northern France uh, of the First World War, for example, or you go to the, the, the cemeteries and the memorials, you know, that's another one. You, you go there, you stand there, and when you stand there, you, get, you, you feel it. And it's all about the feeling, I think. And, and, and that's when it comes alive. And, and it then means something different to everybody. You know, everybody has their own feeling about it. And, and you know, it means something different to, to, to everyone. And I, I think that's kind of, you know, that is also possible with history that is a lot further back. Yeah, um, definitely. With Wars of the Roses and the Tudors and everything. And, and as you say, I think uh, only standing there do you do you find out what that means for you and 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 yeah and i think that's kind of part of the exciting journey of it and and that it does is at the heart of what we um what we do with these battlefields i don't know if this is i know you said something really sexist then so i'm not going to say that now um but i've i've stood somewhere and just cried because i've just been overwhelmed maybe this is maybe this is a history person's thing um yeah, i quite often get that i i the, you know, and this is sort of a semi-plug. I, I, <laughs> okay. I, I do okay. need lots of tours uh, for various companies, um, weekend tours or, or slightly longer tours. Uh, not just Wars of the Roses, I do English Civil War and, and all the other sorts of ones as well. And you do get that very frequently of people just bursting out in tears. Particularly when you get to something that's such a momentous event like the death of Richard mm. um, comes about. So it does. It, it does affect people um, very strongly. So, um, even if you don't go with me, go with somebody else who knows the battlefield or knows them. And, and you will get this incredible sense. Um, it, it, there's, it might not be quiet, but you always get this sense of stillness. Mm. Mm, definitely. I think that's it. I mean, None of us, obviously, were alive during the Second World War. There'll be nobody now that really has any memories of the First World War, of course. Um, but they, they, because there's some footage, and most of us will have known people who perhaps fought in or remembered. Like My dad was a small child, for example, in the Second World War, and he, he would talk to me about it. And you still get people say, oh, there's loads of books written about Tudors and, and the, like, the Wars of the Rose, and there are. But there's so many books written about the Second World War, novels and, and things, and that almost, it makes it seem, I think, more real to people. They can equate to that a little bit better because it's, especially like when I was young, it was more in living history almost. And, and you, you can see videos of people in the trenches or, you know, talking about it on a documentary. And that, obviously things have changed a lot, but people at meal times at the same they ate the same sorts of foods they lived in the terraced houses that millions of people still live in now even though they've got central heating and they did and it's a lot more relatable but actually you know these people went onto battlefields and died just like the people in the first and second world wars just because it was all that time ago it doesn't make it any less horrific 
and, and terrifying and those people deserve just as much memory and respect so I, I don't know if it's that as part of what I feel I, I can watch at the cenotaph um, on the in November and, and feel really quite emotional about that but it's it's the same sort of thing it's just horrible and it doesn't matter what side of a battle you agree with it's just all those people face that and it's something that nobody should ever have to do no. and, and not decrying it at all of course in in the wars of the roses and to a certain extent in the civil war um lots of people it was even more very more horrific if it can be any more horrific because it was very personal mm. it was not like in later periods where you died at a distance you literally had to have be nose to nose which makes it even more terrifying because you've literally got a it's going to sound horrible here so um a warning hacking somebody's arm off you, you had to be there to do it it wasn't something that was done at a distance and also as well you know a lot of the people in those days who were involved in these battles had no idea what was really actually cracking off and what they were fighting for at all and you just had to go with what you had and if what you had was like you know just i don't know um it's a weapon of choice pick something like you're like who's going to likely to be a sword or, or a pole axe yeah. or a bill and a pole axe that's what i was trying to think of yeah and, and then you just had maybe a rudimentary helmet and and some sort of like one protective layer maybe that might cover your upper body so you know you the people at the top have got the armor and the chain and all this and that are as sort of protected as you can be but you're going into that situation with that which is going to offer you very little to no protection in the grand scheme of things so these poor souls are going out there like lambs to the slaughter for something that they have absolutely no idea really what they're fighting for you know people could and they probably don't even know a lot of the time who these people are they might know who the king is but they're not going to know who the people necessarily like somerset and people like that they're not going to know really who those people are so they're out there getting hacked to bits and they don't even know why yeah yeah you know it's it's I don't know. And I look at, so obviously with Somerset and I see a, a little bit of a parallel with Cromwell and the pilgrimage of grace, but at least then people stood up and they knew what they wanted. Yeah. They, yeah. They were putting themselves in the situation for something that they very firmly wanted and believed in. And they made a sort of a, a, a more informed choice, but these poor souls in this period were just dragged away from their lives, leaving their families destitute you know oh, yeah, yeah. And, and of course that doesn't include the amount of people who die afterwards from the mm -hmm. wounds yeah yeah um I, I, that is that is a number of people and we get glimpses of it but nobody really knows how many people were in that battle that died in months later three months later six months later from all the assorted illnesses that you would get associated with a wound yeah well, I mean, it, it's obvious, you know, how easy an infection could have set in to even a small wound, really. Um, and that's, that's a pretty horrible way to go. <laughs> so it's taken a cheerful turn, hasn't it? Yes, well, uh, on, on, on that note. <laughs> on that note. <laughs> um, so do, do you have a, like a, a what you're doing next planned? And is it all like a big conspiracy you can't say or are you have you got anything else specifically in mind at the moment so we have a few things we're, we're currently working on um there's we're, we're on the cusp of announcing something we're, we're in the process of planning um which is in an event kind of format which is quite cool um that should be we should be announcing that probably sometime next week towards the end of the <sighs> watch this space yeah if, if we're on the uh if we're on uh, if we're on track um so that that we won't divulge too much about because obviously we're going to announce it uh, later on but in terms of uh video content obviously we still want to we're still working on the the next battles um because of where we've got to uh in in the story we don't really want to be 
shifting the chronological order of the battles. So the next series are more are further north, and and well, I, we're based uh, we're based in, in down south. So at the moment we can't get on the location to to do the shooting, but we're still in the planning of those videos. We're still preparing them. What we might do is we're also looking at releasing some of the kind of the Zoom conversations Mike and I have where we discuss. The battles in more detail um, which is normally all about basically we'll reference things in the short video which is uh, on location telling the story uh, without getting bogged down in all the nitty-gritty yeah. uh, you know research and interpretation um, and then the things we reference in the videos we will then discuss in more detail if they need more if we need to talk more about them um, and so we, we're, we're looking at uh, releasing a few more of those to kind of you know keep us going until till we can get to the battles themselves um, so that's kind of what we're working on at the moment. Um, and, and we're also doing some research on some other periods of history, which once the Wars of the Roses this year, we've completed our journey, our quest of going through all the battlefields. We're not stuck on the Wars of the Roses. It's not just about the Wars of the Roses. This channel will be able to expand to different periods, the English Civil War, the Napoleonic Wars, um, you know, anything really around the, around the world. Um, so, so there is more to come in, in, in that sense as well. But at the moment, our focus is on the Wars of the Roses and, and how we um, navigate COVID to get those, get those battle, um, battle walks done and, and get those 10,000 steps in. The plague, the plague, the plague has brought everything to a standstill. Now, um, less serious question. What have you had any moments when you've been filming that you were one of those you couldn't have made that up moments or you just couldn't stop laughing or someone in the background has just been like and like proper so you could put together like a bloopers reel kind of thing you must have had some great moments we, we, we've we've had a few uh, we've had a few um the 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 crew we work with the, the crew i work with is a is what we call the bubble crew so they they're all in our they're all in my bubble so uh with that's what allowed us last year to go around and stick within our bubble and, and do the filming on locations and actually there was uh there's a few there's a few situations you know we had one with uh with a we were on a golf course in northampton um, doing, um, talking about the Battle of Northampton, which the battlefield is very well preserved by the golf, the Delapree Golf Center. Um, but we had ourselves some buggies and, and we had, uh, I like, we, I, we had one of the bubble crew gets dressed in this kind of medieval gear. Yep. Yep. All the weapons and armor hanging off. And, uh, and so, and so we were kind of like running around like, nipping around this golf course on this on this buggy like all geared out in this medieval armor and all these golf players looking a little bit confused <laughs> it was an interesting one we also had at the uh, battle of mortimer's cross we tried to shoot it all in one day which meant traveling from london to mortimer's cross in a day shooting everything in a day and then coming back that's a long day. day we basically just had this uh in the middle of what we believe is to have been the battlefield site, obviously with Mortimer's Cross, they haven't isolated specifically where it took place, but we know the area. So um, we could safely say we had a barbecue in the middle of nowhere, but where the route probably would have taken place after the battle. And we're there, you know, um, cooking our sausages on the end of our swords, which was, which was good. As fun. you do. As you do. Yeah. It's just, yeah. It's, it's one of those, it's just kind of like having a, having a bit of fun with it as well and um, pushing, uh, one of the members of the bubble crew into the freezing cold river was also. I think I actually commented on that one. I said, "Like that looks cold." And you went, "No, don't care. It wasn't me." <laughs> yeah, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. I, I wanted his head to go under the water. I wanted him to fully submerge himself and commit to the role he was given. <laughs> uh, fortunately, uh, uh, he didn't. But it, but it still looks great. I mean, the poor guy is freezing cold, and we, you know. Uh, we wrote, only got a car and a lot of towels to kind of warm him up afterwards um but that that was kind of that was fun it's 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 about having fun with it and one of the great things is when we interact with the the public uh, around the area and they ask what we're doing and we talk to them about the battlefields and, and and what we're doing and it's amazing how much history these you know people do know of their local area but also don't know so like yeah. in St Albans I find it very interesting because it's a very it's got a lot of history uh, so people know a lot about it but they they tend to not really know much about the battles from the, the Wars of the Roses, funnily enough. Um, 
but so so yeah there's lots of fantastic uh, moments we've had um, we've had people kind of you know um you know like chasing us and then we've had other people <laughs> supporting us and it's yeah it's just it's just one one hell of a road trip really <laughs> it would be so nice wouldn't it if uh, yeah obviously you've got a, a bit too if mike you would be able to go down one day as well and join them but it's the situation has just not lent itself to that in any capacity and obviously if people gone oh well we'll wait till covid's finished then we'd all you know, we're all still sat here like nearly a year later and we'd have done absolutely nothing in the interim so um but it would be really nice if you could like you could, you could dress up mike and we want him to come down we definitely want him to come down i think it's it's on it's on, it's on the plan isn't it mike yeah, we'll, we'll probably we'll manage to make it work in time for Bosworth or, or Stoke or something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. One of the other stories we had is when we were doing some filming for the uh, Battle of Northampton and we're, we're all in armour and stuff climbing through the ditch, which is the stream that the army would probably would have had to have been crossed to get into the encampment. You know, just this out of nowhere, this golf ball just comes flying. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and like bouncing off the shield that I happen to be holding, and you're like, ah, you know, so all sorts Very of authentic things. moment there. Oh yeah, I mean, God, the adrenaline after that. <laughs> and and it's all these little things I think as well that appeal to people, and you can tell those sorts of stories, you know, because these are just these little comedy moments that you couldn't write, yeah, at, at all. So, oh goodness, I just yeah, it's so much fun, and it's definitely it's innovative and it's fun and it's you have the bits that are fast paced like you say when you're actually doing the filming you know it's a little bit quicker and it's getting it all in and there's something happening all the time and everything's relevant so it flows really well and, so, and then you go back and you have the conversation in the next video like a week or so later mm. where you sit down and people can sort of pick it all apart so you know it's combining something very very new with a tried and tested um, older method and I think this is one thing now and certainly this situation is really bought this sort of method of, of communicating and interviewing and to, to life because I probably wouldn't have thought of using it myself mm. um, so it, it's been really positive in in that respect um, but it, it's just so good to sort of mix all these things up because it appeals to everybody I think in in that way and when you're doing it you do look like you're enjoying it you really, <laughs> really do <laughs> you yeah, know it's a guilty like, pleasure it is a guilty pleasure <laughs> oh no and, and, and but that again you can tell when someone's passionate about something mm. that we will uh, most people know that um whenever I we do these things people always know that whoever I'm talking to we've normally been chatting for at least an hour beforehand and we were saying that like people sometimes don't like to ask us something because we'll, they'll, they'll want this like quick answer like oh who did that and why and we'll be like let me get my notes <laughs> <laughs> put the kettle on uh, and so we all just love it and we live it and we, we we can't understand if people aren't excited about it I was telling I, I was uh, I, I was telling a friend of mine a story um, recently. Um, oh, God, what was it about? It was about an expedition up into the Arctic where the ships were just lost. And and what I found amazing about that particular story was that we we actually knew where the ships had where the last ship had been seen, uh, the last fighting of the ship since the time of the event because the Inuits kind of uh, tradition of storytelling and, and, and the way they tell history is they hand it down. But uh, the Western historians had completely ignored them because they were like, this is hearsay, this is just Chinese whispers. But the Inuits basically were saying that actually, you know, for them, it's life and death. If mm -hmm. they, you know, if they were taught, you know, if they tell someone uh, there, there's, you know, there's seals over there to be hunted, they have to be over there to be hunted because it is a matter of life and death in that, that cold climate. Um, and I was telling this story about how, so actually we knew where the ships were all along, but we just decided to ignore them. So events so recently, they discovered where these ships were, which was awesome. Um, and my friend was kind of sat there listening to me and he just had this kind of complete, completely kind of like face, just like by the end of it looked worn out. But at the same <laughs> time, when I finished, when I finished, you did say, in fairness, it's not the story, is it? It is how you tell it. Because he actually found it really interesting. <laughs> The fact I'd gone on for like half an hour was beside the point. You well, found it interesting. Don't want to know the answer. They shouldn't ask the question. <laughs> uh, yeah, mo most things that you know 
might seem quite dry it is it is in the presentation and as you say history I didn't pursue history after GCSE so for those of you who aren't in the UK GCSE is a kind of like our first level of serious exam for one and then what you do with then afterwards is you gradually feed onto your more specific area and I did history and my history teacher was great and he was really fun and but because he was really fun I think he'd just given up basically he didn't want to be in teaching anymore he was just over it and he wanted to retire and um so it was a little bit and so I didn't pursue it and but I did, my first degree was in sociology and actually, when I look at that, a lot of what we looked at, we were studying things from historical perspectives, you know, like like power and land and like how people's um, how lands changed in hands and so many things, actually, and philosophy and the, like those historical periods. And I can see where there's like there's like quite strong crossovers with some of that stuff. Maybe that's what called me to sociology is that I, I loved history, but I didn't know yet. So, so I don't people. know how much it's pushed at schools either, to be honest. I yeah. don't really, these days, I, I don't know. Um, I, people, obviously, I'm in Leicestershire. So obviously people talk about Richard III here a lot. Like, I'm sure they should. Yeah, <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm down the road from Richard III. We're practically neighbours. We're almost besties. So it's like, you know, but then how much do other places talk about? that particular period of history you know I mean it's like and I think one of the reasons that the Tudors is so popular is because it's talked a lot and people remember it because you couldn't write the story of Henry VIII and the wives if you presented it as a novel people go that's absolutely ridiculous no one's going to believe that <laughs> it's ludicrous it's just <laughs> not it's not possible there is no other word to describe it that just just you know and, and I suppose that again that that's that's it's it's more like a story he did what? <laughs> How many? You know, and, and that's what sort of, and then that sticks in people's heads. But, and then people can be very guilty of staying in their one favourite area mm. as well, can't they? But Mike and I have sort of discussed this before when we, we did some, um, a chat about the Civil War, the first battle of the Civil War and the lead up to that, is that you can't, and as you might, you touched at this at the beginning, you can't look at anything in isolation what happened in, in like the English Civil War really wasn't in terms of time frame that far removed from the end of the Tudor period. Mm. There were a lot of things that were still basically just traveling through in the same sort of fashion. And, um, but people will tend to stick to what they know because it's comfortable and it's familiar, but they're missing out. And, and, you know, I, even though I sort of, I sit myself in the Tudor period, and, and Mike knows this actually the wars of the roses and everything, I love just as much that that and late Plantagenet period I love just as much as the Tudor period well I, I was thinking about this the other day and I was uh, doing some research on the Napoleonic Wars and um, there are some fantastic photos of some veterans and survived French survivors of Waterloo in their uniforms when they're 70 or 80 uh, years old um, so fantastic real photographs of people who served you know at the Battle of Waterloo and then I was thinking about what you just said about the way it all kind of links together and how actually, you know, what the First World War is to us, mm. the Napoleonic War was to the people of the First yeah. World War. Yeah. Actually, the First World War for us was over 100 years ago and, and the P Napoleonic Wars was over 100 years ago for, for them at the time. Mm. And, and it's so, so it's just that, that kind of concept of when you start piecing it together, you understand how things move from A to B. But if you only look at A or you only look at C and you miss B, you, in a way, there's this huge void in between that that is is you kind of you can get lost in. But actually, when you start piecing it together, it's it's you can't, you really start to understand threads and things that kind of appear. Um, Mike and I were talking about Northampton, which he talks about in his his new book as well. Uh, you know about how um, a lot of people were being depopulated uh, before the civil war in the county and uh, you know because of the they were moving to sheep farming and getting rid of the labor intensive farming and so a lot of people were you know were basically losing their their employment and were very poor being driven to the town and how that actually affects the stance the parliamentarian stance of northampton during the english civil war and again it's one of those things that you know you could just say they were parliamentarian but actually when you look at why yeah you know, it may, it begins to all make sense and, and it, it just adds to that understanding. 
Gentlemen, before we finish, is there anything that either of you would like to add stroke plug? Uh, Meaningful facial expressions now. I just, just want to say thank you for having us uh, today. Thank you for coming. Uh, fantastic to talk to you and, uh, and for everybody listening as well. Thank you for, for, for giving us your time. Um, it's yeah, it's it's an exciting journey, and I think all we all I'd like to say is you know we welcome anyone to join us on that journey and, and building a community, discussing the ideas, you know, hearing feedback, hearing ideas, you know, potentially things people want to see as well. All of that, we're very open to it, and and we look forward to to exploring more in the future, and 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 yeah, and telling more stories. So that's that's all I have to say, really. Mike. Yeah. Thank you as always, Catherine, for coming on. I always enjoy our chats. Yeah, we did um, for hours. I did. I did more. Oh, we, we do. I did give we him do. a fair warning. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, of course. Um, have to plug the new book, Northampton: Five Thousand Years of History. Obviously, there's quite a large chunk talking about the Tudors uh, and, and Northampton and Tudor Northampton, including why Northampton at the time was known as the smelliest town in England. <laughs> I bet it had some stiff competition, though. Well, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> not, with, not with Northampton. It, it's actually to do with the tanneries and, okay. the, and the smell of the tanneries. Um, but yeah, so so if you're interested in that, have a read of that. It's available on Amazon if anybody wants a copy. And I've nearly twisted Catherine's arm for high enough of her neck. Um, to be able to do a review of it in due course. Oh, I will do. I will do. I, I now I've ploughed through this genealogy. Once I've broken the back of a decent amount of research, I'm going to allow myself some some other books as well. But I, I would imagine do do the Howards creep into any of your work? They must do at some stage. A little bit, but only very much on the edges. Um, the main family is sort of the Montagues mm. uh, are the key one, and they are. And again, talking about sort of influences down over time uh it's very interesting how during the dissolution of the monasteries that the montagues come to the fore and how they continue to influence all the way down um the same with the spencers um and again the same actually um five of the six fir very first american presidents actually came from families came from northamptonshire wow that's amazing um which is which is one that's, that's quite often forgot, uh, including obviously George Washington, um, and most of their where they grew up and, or their their families were, um, you can still go and see today. So it's um, it, know, it's I, worth doing having a look. Oh, I I keep sort of booking onto things that Mike does, and then they get cancelled again. So there's, there's sort of several things in the bag that have just been like, oh well, maybe next time. Oh well, next next month, or maybe in a couple of months' time, and and here we are. So we, we will all catch up and get together at some juncture. Obviously, I'm um, we, to that drink, that pub, when that pub opens. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever been? I'm sorry, everybody's watching this. Um, Mark, I'm sure you've been to the Dog and Hedgehog, haven't you? Yeah. 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 They do an amazing roast dinner, Thomas, and they have a part. They have um, an ale called Henry Tudor. Ah, okay. So that that's definitely worth a punt just for the novelty value. The balance. They now need a Richard the Third as well. Well, well, it's my thinking. I'm surprised they haven't been sort of brought down for that. Well, Crooked Billet in um, on the edge of Towton Battlefield. They do absolutely amazing Sunday lunches up there. Right, so you need uh, to get them brewing a Richard III, don't you? I don't know whether they have or not. Um, but whenever I do my tours up there, we always make a point of going there for lunch because yes, they're that yes. good. Because we were going to, when we organised, we ordered, um, organised a battlefields walk together, didn't we? Yes. And, like, and, and then for various different reasons didn't come off. But um, I know at Bosworth they sell um, Henry Tudor and Richard III wine and... Is it ales or stouts? They or do an, yeah, an, a, a stout, I think it is. Yeah, so which which is not really my thing, but I bought it because I bought them because of the bottles because they said like the labels on of each of the kings. So. That's exactly why they wanted. That's exactly what they wanted to happen. Yeah, the, the people like me. So we've got the people who like alcohol. And we've got the people who just buy it because of what for the bottles. So yeah. the sticker on the front, and you've got you've got a sale literally that i i am that person that can't can't resist and you can't just have one you have to have both yeah yes 
So exactly. Right. Well, Mike, hopefully I will see you out and about again very soon on um, one of our jaunts. Um, Thomas, and maybe the same as well. If, if we are all able to be within 6,000 feet of each other by the time you come to Bosworth, I would love to come and see because Bosworth is my favourite place in the whole world. I'm sure it is. <laughs> Apart from Disney World, but we won't talk. I do cheat on history with Disney World, I'm afraid. But it's close. No it's comment. Close. <laughs> <laughs> I know, that's never something that I thought I would be as, as a huge Disney nut. But yeah, I love Bosworth. It's just, I just feel so, I don't know, settled and centred when I'm there. It's really hard to describe, isn't it, that feeling where you, you, you love a historical location and it just makes you feel very calm and inspired. You just feel part of the landscape. Yeah, it's it's, and I'm not really a countryside person. I'm one of them, but there, I just love it. And I can't even know it's not even that far from me. I can't go right now. Yeah, it's tickling, isn't it? Even though it's 25 minutes, it's it's travelling. So, but we will all get there one day. So yes, I'll pop lots of information underneath the video when it's uploaded. Thomas, I think you have a very bright future in front of you. Thank you very much. So we will all be watching very keenly. Um, yeah, anytime you want to give us all some information, please do, we will look out for you. And I look forward to all the forthcoming videos because I say I, I love this period and it's such a great way of doing it. So thank you gentlemen very much, both of you, for your time. And hopefully I will speak to you and maybe even see both of you in the not too distant future. Okay. <laughs> thank you both so thank much. You. Thank Take you so care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.